Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. It's the time of year that gardeners are preparing for the upcoming growing season. While you might be thinking ahead to what you need to do or what you want to plant, one of the first things to consider is soil test. That's where UVM Extension's Agricultural and Environmental Testing Lab comes in. To find out what we can learn from testing our soil, our own Ben Willis took a tour of the lab with Assistant Professor Joshua Faulkner, who heads the Center for Sustainable Agriculture. We are in the University of Vermont's Agricultural and Environmental Testing Laboratory, otherwise known as the Soils Lab. At, at UVM. That's in Jefferts Hall, which is on UVM's main campus in, in Burlington. So we're in the um, instrument room right now. This is where we have a, have a lot of our um, high-tech instruments that we use for soil and water analyses. This is our, our new Pride and Joy. This is um, our uh, total carbon and nitrogen analyzer for soils. Um, we just got this a couple months ago, and this allows us to measure how much total carbon is within a soil sample. And that is a really hot question right now because of um, people trying to understand um, carbon sequestration in soils related to, to climate change. And this is, this is kind of a top of the line instrument and it allows UVM, I say, like kind of to move into the big leagues when it comes to, comes to um, soil testing and analytical services around soil carbon. This is a lab that does a, a couple things. One is we process and provide recommendations on over 6,000 soil samples every year for Vermont farmers and gardeners and other landowners. Um, the other piece of what happens here is a lot of um, soil and water laboratory analyses. What are some of the things you can learn about soil by testing it here? Most of our soil samples are what we call a routine soil sample, um, and those primarily provide um, what the nutrient status is within your soil. So macronutrients as well as some of your, like your, your um, phosphorus and potassium, and, and then some of your, your micronutrients as well. Um, a, so a routine soil sample will also provide pH of the soil. Um, whether you need to adjust that with liming or not, that would be a recommendation that would come, come out of that. Um, also provide the organic matter content of your soil, and a lot of folks are very interested in that, kind of a, a really um, kind of broad measure for how healthy, healthy your soil is. I can see how this would be really helpful for farmers, but what about home gardeners? Should they be getting their soil tested? Absolutely. Anyone who is, is, is managing you know, fruits or vegetables or other crops, um, if, you don't, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. So you know, we recommend that you know, for farmers, of course, because it's really critical for their productivity and profitability. But you know, for gardeners, it's important. I think of it as I love to garden. I know a lot of people who love to garden. They put a lot of time into their garden. Um, and why not try to maximize that time investment with a simple soil sample to understand what nutrients your soils need to help your vegetable crops or your, your other plants maximize their, their production and, and get the best return on your, your time spent gardening. With all the data that you're collecting, all the soil that you're bringing in, do you do anything more with that data? Does it help with research? Yeah, great question because you can imagine Soil Testing Lab has been here for decades, right? So we've collected quite a database of, of, of Vermont um, soils. And so we, we do on occasion, especially working with other researchers of Vermont, um, at, you know, within Extension or within Plant and Soil Sciences, are interested around like um, state patterns of, of nutrient concentrations. And so we have that database. It's all anonymous. We don't have any names associated with it, but we can look at some of those big patterns of, you know, have soil nutrient concentrations changed through time? Um, are soil concentrations higher in one part of the state than the other? Um, we've had some folks recently interested in, um, you know, how much carbon is in our, our, in our soils in Vermont? So we have organic matter concentrations and, and we can help provide some information to those folks who are interested in trying to understand um, climate change mitigation um, research questions as well. How does it work if I wanted to bring my soil in? What oh do I yeah, right. yep, so pretty simple. Um, first thing I would say, I'd recommend going to um, our, our website, which is um, e probably the easiest way to get there is to just Google UVM Ag and Environmental Testing Lab. That'll, that should get you to us. Um, there's a handy guide on there for how to take a soil sample. 
pretty simple. You know, if you have a typical size vegetable garden, take 10 subsamples, mix them up really well. Take anywhere from a half a cup to a cup of that sample, put it in um, any plastic bag that seals up really well, print off a submission form, put a check with it, it's $15 um, for routine soil sampling, and just mail that to us. If you're in the Burlington area, you can also drop it off right here in Jeffords. We have a drop box in the, in the main entryway of Jeffords downstairs, and we also have um, uh, uh, bins where you can drop them up here at uh, around 262 on the second floor of Jeffords. I will say, um, like most things, inflation is uh, affecting us as well. So right now, soil samples are 15 bucks. As of July 1, they're going to jump to 17. So if you want a good deal, save two bucks. Go ahead and do it and send it in to us before July 1. As Joshua mentioned, you can get soil testing information by visiting the UVM Extension website for the Ag and Environmental Testing Lab. You may also be interested to learn that Extension will be holding a Garden Soil Health Day on Saturday, May 13th. It's from 1 to 4 at the UVM Horticulture Research and Education Center at 65 Green Mountain Drive in South Burlington. The event will feature free lead screening of your garden soil to ensure safety and healthy gardening. If you go, bring your soil sample in a zip-locked storage bag. When it comes to growing things indoors, a little bit of knowledge can go a long way towards raising healthier and longer lasting plants. In partnership with UVM Master Gardener Program, today's House Plant Hero segment looks at a plant that's easy to grow and has very few problems. Hi, I'm Judy Miro, a UVM Master Gardener coming to you from the University of Vermont Greenhouses, and I'm here to help you become a house plant hero by providing some guidance on caring for your house plants. Today, our focus is on the Euphorbia lacti, or false cactus, or the candelabra cactus. The cactus and Euphorbia may look similar, but they're very different plants. They initially grew oceans apart. Euphorbia originates from South Africa, while the cactus are native to the Americas. So while we see them sold under the name cactus most everywhere we go, uh, it's because they thrive in very similar or same conditions, hot, sunny, and dry. The reason I adore the euphorbia is because they grow faster and many varieties are easily propagated, like the candelabra. More on that in a moment. So then how do you tell a euphorbia from a cactus? All cactus have spines, while the euphorbias have thorns. Only cactus have what's called areolas, which are the fuzzy spots where the spines, flowers, and stems of the cacti plants grow from. The areolas found on all cactus species, and they're either fuzzy white or fuzzy yellow. You'll never find this on any of these euphorbias. Many people will tell you that it's the flowers that give them away. Cactus flowers are usually large, soft petaled, and come in lively colors. Euphorbia flowers are not much to look at and they're usually quite small, but that's not why you buy a euphorbia. You buy them for their texture, structure, and bold statement. If you should remove any of the thorns from a euphorbia, you'll actually injure the plant. There are other differences, and of course, there will be those varieties that are thorn-free, and you'll have to look closer at leaves of, in the flowers to tell the differences. Just know that the euphorbia will never, ever have one or two thorns together. If you cut your candelabra, you'll notice a milky white sap oozing out. This sap is sticky and toxic to us and our pets. It can cause skin and eye irritation if you allow it to come in contact. This is just another trait of the euphorbia species. Always best to wear gloves and safety glasses if you should accidentally injure your plant. The candelabra is a good self-healer, so hopefully any damage you might do won't be fatal. Wipe off any sap with a cloth or paper towel and allow the plant to heal itself. Branches that you do break off should be set aside for a week or two to harden off before you place them in soil to regrow. The candelabra makes a great houseplant for novice gardeners because it doesn't require a lot of special care. It grows well in indirect light. The brighter the light, the faster it grows. Full south exposure or a west exposure works wonders for this plant. 
Be sure not to place them against a window in the winter. You wouldn't want this plant to catch a chill. The plants will like to keep warm year round. These plants prefer a fast draining cactus soil mix to ensure the soil dries out between waterings. Remembering that the Euphorbia's origins are from Africa, where the conditions are dry, hot, and warm. Overwatering, or as I like to say, overloving your plant will be the death of it. So best to use a moisture meter to be sure this plant is dried out be before you water again. Like most plants, pests don't show up unless the plant is stressed out. Euphorbia has few pests other than aphids and mealybugs. Remember to check for pests every time you water. You wouldn't want to invite critters taking up residency elsewhere. One last thing, as these candelabra or other types of columnar euphorbias age, you'll likely find brown spots appearing. If they are light brown and hard, this is referred to as corking. And it's what happens when your plant gets old. I like to think of it as your plant's well-earned age spots. It's totally normal and you don't have to worry about it. Remember that by providing your plants with the conditions and care they need, you too can be a houseplant hero. For more information on houseplants and home gardens, visit the UVM Extension Master Gardener website and see our garden resources page. Or contact an Extension Master Gardener volunteer at the helpline. The phone number is on your screen. This is Extension Master Gardener Judy Miro wishing you happy growing. Our thanks to Judy and the Extension Master Gardener program. You can find other Houseplant Hero segments by searching the Across the Fence website. That's our program for today. Once again, thank you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well. Mm -hmm.